Alright, uh, I'm going to give a brief talk about Father Peter Whelan, uh, also known as the Angel of Andersonville. Uh, and we'll get into why that was later on. But he was born in 1802 in County Wexford, Ireland. Uh, either March the 4th or March the 14th, not sure. <laughs> Debatable. Um, we know almost nothing about his youth, uh, but we do know that he was at uh, St. Kieran's College in Birchfield uh, and received a good education in the classics and in mathematics. Uh, at some point during that, he answered a call from the new Bishop of Charleston, uh, Bishop John England, who came to America in 1824. Uh, not sure of his port of entry, but uh, <clears throat> he'd studied to be a priest either in Baltimore or under Bishop England, one of the two. Uh, and he was uh, ordained in November of 1830 in Charleston, uh, one of the few dioceses in the United States at that time, uh, and he kind of became a secretary to the bishop for a while and then assigned to different parishes. Uh, he ends up in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he says the first Catholic mass there uh, in 1832 at the home of a Presbyterian. Uh, and from some recent research, apparently he was fairly instrumental in getting a church built in Raleigh. Uh, in 1837, he's assigned to the Church of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Locust Grove, Georgia. Now, for those of you from Georgia and thinking Outlet Mall, uh, no. Uh, the original Locust Grove is located just outside of a town named Sharon, which is about 20 miles or so below Washington, Georgia, so much closer to Augusta. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with river traffic from Savannah up. Uh, and in addition to his priestly duties, uh, he also has to help plow fields, grow food, uh, somewhat maintain what few roads there were in the area. Um, plus, uh, baptizing, uh, burying, and getting con the youth confirmed. And when the second bishop of Charleston came in 1844, he made this comment about uh, the church there in Locust Grove. It says, in the diocese, there is not a congregation, remote and rural as it is, in which taking proportionate numbers to scale, we find more communicants, nor one in which the youth are more moral, orderly, or better instructed. So he was passing on the faith as, that's the job of a priest, really. Um, in 1850, the Diocese of Savannah is formed. And due to a yellow fever epidemic, uh, he's called there in 1854. Uh, it's where he will stay for the rest of his life. Uh, when the second bishop died of Savannah, uh, uh, Bishop Barry, uh, they tried to get him to take the bishopric, but he refused. They had to twist his arm to become the administrator of the diocese. So he's fairly high up. When the new bishop and it comes in 1861, Bishop Augustine Barreau out of Florida. Um, he makes Father Whelan the vicar general of the diocese, which is kind of next in line to the bishop. Uh, somewhat of a secretary, I mean, he still has duties in a parish, but uh, he would help the bishop out. Uh, when war breaks out, um, some of the units from Savannah that garrisoned Fort Pulaski were Irish Catholic. So Father Whelan volunteers to go out there and minister uh, to the Catholic congregation. Uh, 
Well, he was also friendly to any denomination that was there. Uh, he really didn't care. His main goal was for the Catholics, but the rest of the people, he would provide spiritual instruction as he could. Uh, in April of 1862, the Federals cut the garrison off from everything. They pretty much isolated. Uh, and they start their bombardment on April the 10th. Two days later, the fort surrenders. Uh, and the garrison that are captured are taken to Governor's Island in New York. Uh, Father Whelan didn't have to go. He was a non-combatant, and he was not part of the Confederate Army at all. He was just there as a priest. But he said, that's my congregation. I go with them. Uh, now, when they get to Governor's Island, the officers and Father Whelan uh, are allowed pretty much free reign of the uh, island itself. The enlisted guys, on the other hand, are confined to a place called Castle William, uh, kind of dank, wet, uh, moldy, almost no latrine facilities, no cooking facilities. Uh, so it wasn't a real wonderful place. Father Whelan, using his Catholic connections with churches in New York City, is able to obtain foodstuffs, supplies, and whatnot. Uh, one of the things that happened while they were there, the officers from Fort Pulaski realized that his clothing is getting a little shabby. So they contract to get a new suit of clothes made for him. And they sneak it in at night, take the old clothes, and, uh, said that Father did show a little bit of vanity the next morning when he got his clothes. However, after a short period of time, Father Whelan's back in the old clothes. So the garrison commander, uh, Colonel Olmstead, asked him, well, Father, where's the new clothes? He said, well, I gave them to a, a enlisted prisoner who came in, and he had been caught swimming in his underwear, and he had no clothing. Colonel Olmstead, well, why didn't you give him the old clothes? And his quote was, when I give for Christ's sake, I give the best. Uh, he has a wonderful sense of humor that we'll talk about. Uh, after the garrison is exchanged in August of 62, he comes back to Savannah. He takes up his duties as vicar general again. And a priest who was visiting from Virginia described him thus. He stands nearly six feet with drab hair, coarse, ill-shaped continents, rounder swinging shoulders, long arms, short body, and long legs with feet of more than ordinary size. He may comb his hair sometimes, but if so, it shows no indication of it, as it is generally in a standing condition. His coat is not of the latest nor approved fashion, the sleeves exposing some inches of the lower part of his arm and a large rough hand. His pants extend only a little below the knees, exhibiting a considerable portion of his stockings and unpolished or ash-colored shoes. He is fully sensible of his personal exterior. One day he met a brother priest to whom nature was no more liberal than to himself. Well, he said, your mother and mine must have been women of great virtue because they did not drown us when they first saw us. None but mothers of great patience could have raised such ugly specimens of humanity. So again, his sense of humor. Now we'll fast forward to 1864. In May of 1864, Father William Hamilton, who is pastor of Assumption Church in Macon, uh, is coming south to visit a mission church in Americus and discovers this place. Uh, by that point in time, it's beginning to fill up, uh, probably well over 10,000 by that time. Uh, so on his way back to Macon, he stops for two or three days. Uh, he realizes that there's a lot of Catholics here, and they could use some spiritual guidance and, and the sacraments. So he writes to the bishop, and request that he sent the priest here to minister. Uh, Father Wheeler, probably the one who gets the letter originally, volunteers. 
probably because he has some apathy toward prisoners having been one himself. Uh, now, Father Whelan didn't keep a diary that we know of yet, uh, but Father Hamilton did describe this place while he was here at the end of May. And you can picture what it is out here. I found the stockade extremely filthy. The men all huddled together and covered with vermin. I found the hospital almost as crowded as a stockade. The men were dying there very rapidly from scurvy, diarrhea, and dysentery. They were not only covered with the ordinary vermin, but also maggots. They had nothing under them at all except the ground. This was basically a pile of dirt out here. No grass, nothing growing. Uh, so Father Whelan gets here on June the 16th, 1864. He will not leave until sometime around the beginning of uh, excuse me, October, uh, having stayed here four months. Uh, he lived in a shack uh, about a mile from here up in the village, and his daily routine was to get up, say his divine office, uh, and then have a breakfast of cornbread, cow peas, and occasionally a vegetable. Uh, he drank parched corn coffee that he purchased with his own money uh, to alleviate having to drink the water while he was here. Uh, and it's said of him that he would get here about 9 in the morning at the gates. He had a permanent pass from Commander Wirtz to be able to go in and out freely. Uh, he would come in at 9 and generally stayed until sundown. And it's said that he went back. He would again say his prayers, uh, have another meager meal, and fall asleep full of sorrow for all he had seen that day. Uh, and it changed day by day for him. Uh, while he was here, he also carried an umbrella to shield his head from the intense sun. Uh, when the prison population begins growing through June, uh, he requests from the bishop that another priest be sent to help him out. And a Father Henry Clarval is sent. Uh, Father Clarval left us a diary, left us a list of over 300 prisoners that he had either baptized or given last rites to um, while he was here. Uh, he's only able to stay about 36 days uh, because he, it's, he even said in his own diary, he could not stop vomiting. So Father Whelan sent him home, back to Savannah. Uh, off and on, there were, and Father Whelan says there were always two priests here. So they kind of rotated around. Total priests, including the bishop, uh, there were seven who were here. Uh, now when the raiders, and if you've heard that story, uh, were put down by a group called the Regulators, um, there was a trial that was held. And it was all Union soldiers who were the defense attorneys, the prosecuting attorneys, the judge, and they had a uh, jury of all made up of sergeants who had only recently arrived, so they didn't know a whole lot about what the Raiders had done. Six of them were convicted to hang. Uh, Wirtz did provide the lumber and whatnot for the gallows. Um, Father Whelan went to the six who were confined in the stocks uh, the day before the execution, offering them confession and absolution, which they refused because they thought that the hanging was actually just a sham. Uh, they found out the next day it wasn't. Father Whelan led the procession in, um, saying prayers for the dead. Uh, he pleaded with the prisoners not to go through with this. He was shouted down. Uh, and finally, the hangman looked at him and said, hurry up, old man, and drop the plank. Uh, five of the six died almost instantly. One, the rope broke. They had to bring him back and hang him again. Uh, so by September, the end of September 64, prisoners are being moved out of here wholesale. 
sometimes as many as 5,000 in a day, because the fear was that Sherman's army, after capturing Atlanta, would move this way and liberate the prison. Well, they really didn't want him to see what Andersonville was like. So they began moving prisoners out to uh, uh, Camp Lawton in Mill Millen, Georgia, Savannah, and Florence in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, after Father Whelan decides he can leave, uh, he comes back, or we think he comes back, in uh, late January, early February of 1865. He borrows $16,000 in Confederate money, equivalent to about 400 in gold, uh, from a wealthy businessman in Macon by the name of Henry Horn. Uh, and he uses that money to go into Americas and buy flour. Now, the flour came from a different places around the state, but he made a deal with Wurtz that all of that flour would be baked into bread strictly for the prisoners. And the prisoners referred to it as Wheelan's bread. And num numerous of them said that it was the only thing that kept them alive until the prison closed. Uh, so after the war, uh, Father Wheelan says, well, I'm going to write to the government and try to get Mr. Horn's $400 back because he's hurt. Apparently all his money was in Confederate script, which is now worthless. Uh, so he writes to Secretary of War Edmund Stanton, and Stanton replies back, well, yes, that's nice that you helped the Union prisoners, and if you can provide receipts for everything that you purchased, we'd be more than happy to pay you back. Well, by that time, Father Wheeling contracted a lung ailment here. We think it's probably tuberculosis. Um, and he writes back to Stanton and says, you know, I ha have neither the health nor the time to go all over Georgia collecting these receipts. Um, but he didn't let the matter die there. Uh, he sent a little article in to the uh, Savannah Daily News and Herald, and he said this, no amount of salary could induce me to stay at Andersonville for one week and attend the sick and dying. No, sir, not all the gold and paper money in the Treasury at Washington. My motive was not money. It was to allay misery and gain souls to God. And I am satisfied that I am much farther above Mr. Stanton in kindness of heart than he is above me in office of state. Uh, because he's sick, the, uh, some of the congregations in, Atlanta, in uh, Savannah excuse me, take up a collection to move him north. It was thought that the cold climate would be much better for his lung ailment. Didn't know about Arizona at the time. Uh, and Father Whelan basically signs his death warrant. Rather than use that money to move north, he pays back Mr. Horn what he was owed. Uh, but after the war, a lot of the prisoners, when they got home, would write about him. And a Henry Davison from the 1st Ohio Artillery wrote this. A Catholic priest visited the hospital almost daily and ministered freely and faithfully to the wants of the dying. I am sorry to be unable to state his name, for he was the only clergyman, as far as I can remember, who ever visited us. He was a noble man, a hero. For by coming here, he exposed himself to great danger of infection with the diseases. He seemed actuated by the holiest motives, kneeling down by the side of the decaying bodies of living men in the stench and filth of the gangrene wards, and interceding with heaven for that mercy to the sufferers, which they could not obtain on earth. Many and many a time I have seen him thus praying with the dying, consoling alike the Protestant and the believers in his own peculiar faith. His services were more than welcome to many and sought by all. For in his kind and sympathizing looks, his meek but earnest appearance, 
the despairing prisoners read that all humanity had not forsaken mankind. Uh, several remarked that he was the only Christian minister to stay so long in their midst, and that on the last day, Father Whelan would certainly hear the words of the master, I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. Uh, the long amulet does kill him. He dies on February the 6th, 1871, uh, at the age of 69. And the Savannah Papers wrote about his funeral procession, saying it was the largest procession seen in Savannah. There were 86 carriages and buggies in the procession. Buried at the Cathedral Cemetery in Savannah. I've been to his grave, I've seen it. Uh, however, there's no record of his funeral mass being said at St. John the Baptist in Savannah. There is no death certificate on file in the city of Savannah, and the sextant of the cemetery has no record of his burial. So, I called him the Angel of Andersonville. Maybe he, he was. It's up to you to decide.